Intravenous therapy, initiation of intravenous therapy. When we get ready to start an IV on a client, there's several things that we need to do. And that begins with our client preparation. We need to teach them what is the purpose of the therapy, the possible duration, any restrictions. We need to maintain the dryness of the site. Don't manipulate that flow rate regulator, whether it's on the machine or it's the roller clamp on the administration set. And the client needs to know when to contact the nurse, such as when the dressing begins to feel wet, if pain develops or swelling develops, or they see blood backing up into the administration set tubing. Make certain that you confirm the order and review the medical record for any allergies. Then we will assess the IV site for suitability and select the most appropriate site for a client and solution to be infused and ensure privacy per the client's wishes. In other words, make certain that if the client does not want anyone in the room, that you clear the room. But if they do want someone there, that you keep someone there. Consider local anesthetic agents, such as anesthetic need is going to be based on the client assessment, the history, their allergies, and the potential for discomfort. Lidocaine can cause vasoconstriction, so that always needs to be a consideration. Use the least invasive anesthetic method possible. We have intradermal lidocaine, which will be effective within 20 to 30 seconds, and it requires a provider order or facility approved protocol. When it is injected, we do it with the needle bevel up and we do it beside the vein if the needle is superficial and on top of the vein if the vein is deep. Make certain that you aspirate prior to the injection to determine that the needle is not in the vein itself. There's also topical transdermal cream and this has to be applied and we frequently will cover that cream with an occlusive dressing for about 30 to 60 minutes to make certain that's a, that it's effective. There's also topical vapo coolant sprays that will provide immediate anesthetic action. And there's pressure accelerated lidocaine that uses a mild electrical current to deliver the anesthetic over a seven to 10 minute time frame. It causes minimal discomfort. We need to make sure then that we document any teaching that was provided and any anesthetics that might have been used. Once again, verify the appropriateness of what you're getting ready to do. Make sure that the type and volume of fluid is correct and that it corresponds to the physician's order. Check that the medications contained in the fluid also correspond with the physician's order. Determine the expiration date of the fluid. Evaluate the integrity of the fluid container. If it's a glass container, the glass has to be free of chips and cracks. A plastic container has to be free of any punctures. And the cap has to be undamaged. Inspect the fluid for clarity and the absence of any particulate matter. Gather the appropriate administration set tubing. It has to be appropriate for the ordered therapy. And it also is going to show you the drop factor. And determine the integrity of the package. If the package uh, integrity has been compromised, then uh, dispose of it and get a new one. Gather the supplies that you're going to need to actually start the IV. So you'll need the cannula with the gauge that's appropriate for the delivery of the therapy that's been ordered and the age of the client. Make certain you have more than one cannula available for use just in case that venipuncture requires more than one attempt. And there should never be more than one or two attempts by 
one nurse. You need the antiseptic that is appropriate for the client. Uh, and that will be dependent on the facility protocol also. You need to make sure that you have tape, IV site dressing, again, dependent upon the facility protocol, a tourniquet, and protective gloves. You'll also need some labels, and this will include an administration set change label, so when does the tubing need to be changed, a fluid container time strip, which is a strip that's attached to the fluid itself, and for example, you have IV orders that is to be infused at 100 mLs per hour. So you can mark every 100 mLs, um, excuse me, you can mark the time at every 100 mLs and then you can with a glance know that say it's been two hours since you initiated, so now it should be on 800. So your time strip is going to help you at a glance determine that your flow rate is correct. And then your solution container label, which can vary from facility to facility um, as to what would be required. Then you're going to attach the administration set to the fluid container. Make certain that you always close the roller clamp on the tubing before you do anything else. Take the cap off of the spike and from the insertion port on the fluid container and then keeping that spike and that insertion port sterile, carefully insert that spike into the port. And if it's a plastic fluid container, take extreme care not to puncture the plastic container. Again, a tubing label would be placed on the administration set indicating when it needs to be changed according to facility policy. And the fluid container label would identify the fluid, medications added, and whatever else the facility uh, requires. Then let's prepare the site. You're going to clip the excessive hair. You should never shave it because shaving is going to create a potential for microabrasions and that will increase the risk of infection. You're going to cleanse the site using an antimicrobial agent that has been specified by your facility. And the site to be cleansed is going to be about the size of the dressing. You would cleanse it for at least 30 seconds using a scrubbing action. Allow that site to dry naturally to prevent any chemical burns. Only one venous access device should be used for each attempt. Difficult vascular access may require careful assessment and collaboration with other nursing staff. Vascular distension can be obtained from tourniquets, gravity positioning, using a warm dry heat such as a warm blanket or a towel, a hand pump, or lightly stroking the vein, especially with alcohol prep. A non-sterile one-time use disposable gloves should also be used, but never palpate the skin at the IV insertion site after cleansing has been performed. Make certain that you follow your checklist for appropriate infusion steps. Always inspect the device for possible defects and then twist that cannula on the stylet to loosen it so it will come off easily when you have it inserted. Pull that skin top below the intended insertion site and stabilize the skin and any veins that may kind of move a little bit. Insert the cannula at a 10 to 15 degree angle with the bevel up. The direct method of insertion is going to require puncturing the skin and the vein all in one motion. And the indirect method will require puncturing the skin and then the vein with the second motion. 
Make certain that you watch for backflow of blood into the flashback chamber, and that will help indicate successful entry. In your textbook, you can see that flashback chamber, uh, and when you do enter that vein, you'll see blood entering that chamber. Cautiously advance the device slightly into the vein, and we do that because the cannula is actually shorter than the needle stylet itself. Lift that device very, very slightly, and then you're going to advance the needle and the catheter at the same time. By doing that, it's going to help prevent going through the opposite side of the vein. While you hold that device securely, advance that catheter into the vein. Cautiously thread it, but never re-advance the needle into the catheter once that threading has begun, because it can actually create a catheter emboli. If the catheter does not easily advance, you can attempt to float it in by using saline or IV fluids to help advance the catheter. When you remove that needle from the catheter, make certain that you apply digital pressure close to where the tip of the catheter is in the vein to uh, prevent any blood backflow. Many IV devices are going to have a button that automatically withdraws the needle. This is also what we consider to be a safety feature. Connect primary line tubing, saline lock, or the short extension tubing with the saline lock to the catheter, whatever's been ordered. And then gently flush that catheter with normal saline and observe the vein. If swelling is noted approximately where the tip of the catheter is in the vein, that vein has not been cannulated and the process has to be repeated. If no swelling is noted or the nurse observes the saline traveling up the vein, cannulation was successful. When you insert a winged infusion set, you need to prime the air from the tubing if it's going to be used for infusions. But we don't really recommend that winged infusion set for infusions because there's a really high risk of infiltration. So aseptically connect that adapter of the administration set tubing. You're going to open that clamp and then allow that fluid to displace the air. Close the clamp. Now, if you're just going to use the winged infusion set for drawing blood, you don't need to remove any air. You're going to use basically the same techniques for inserting an over-the-needle catheter as you would for the winged infusion set, except you're going to pinch the wings together and gently insert the needle into the vein itself. The bevel of the needle needs to be up. You insert it at a 5 to 15 degree angle, and if the tubing has been unprimed, you're going to see blood return in that unprimed tubing. So again, basically you're going to use the same techniques as you would for an over-the-needle catheter. If no swelling is noted or the nurse observes saline traveling up the vein, once again we know that cannulation was successful. Now we need to stabilize the cannula, and that needs to be done in a manner that's not going to interfere with our assessments of that insertion site. We can use skin barrier to help maintain skin integrity. We can use a venous access device that uh, preserves the integrity of the device. It minimizes catheter movement at the hub and it prevents dislodgement of the catheter and loss of venous access. The vascular access stabilization device should be considered the preferred alternative to tape or sutures when feasible. Again, it's going to improve dwell time and reduces overall complications. If tape is used, do not encircle the extremity with tape. 
And dressings need to be applied in a way that it's not going to be directly over the cannula hub and in a way that we can continue to see the site. Remember, if a catheter migrates outside of the vein, we should never readvance it into the vein. It needs to be stabilized where it's at and then reassessed to make sure that proper placement has been maintained in the vein. And if sutures were used to secure a device and they become loose, they're no longer intact, we need to make certain that we remove them. Make certain that you apply a dressing, uh, a label to the dressing containing all of this information. And the initials would be the initials of the nurse who actually initiated the site. Then we need to document that procedure. What type of fluid are we using? How much and what is the flow rate? Were there any additives in it? And if so, what is it and what's the dosage? What type of cannula was used? How big was it and how long was it? How many venipuncture attempts were required to successfully cannulate the vein? And how did the client respond to the procedure? in addition to the name of the person that performed the vena puncture. We also need to document joint stabilization. And we use this if the IV is placed in an area of flexion, but we do not consider it to be a restraint. That joint stabilizer has to be padded and it has to support that area of flexion. It should never impede our assessment of the IV site or the client circulation. We have to do frequent skin checks at pressure areas when we use joint stabilization and our documentation needs to include the device that was used and when we remove it for assessment and range of motion. IV site protection might be required to help protect IV sites and to prevent accidental dislodgement. Soft mittens are going to be recommended for client populations such as our pediatric, our older adults, or those that have cognitive limitations. Soft mittens are not considered to be a restraint. We can use physical immobilization devices also known as restraints, to protect those vascular access device sites if we absolutely have to, but they should never be routinely implemented and should be avoided whenever possible. When IV site protection devices are implemented, we have to document frequent assessment of the skin and the site, and then we also need to make sure that we're doing that.